We are now ready to move into the actual meat of the exercise. And as you may have noted and have a chance to read, we are being introduced to a company called Umbrellas Limited, and it is preparing its fin uh, financial uh, statements on 31st of December 2011. What you can see is that everything has been made ready and is ready for the presentation to the shareholders, except the statement of cash flows. So what we're given here is the balance sheets for 2010 and 2011, as well as the income statement for 2011. These are all presented in the exercise, and we have the numbers that we are going to use to do question one, which asks us to prepare a statement of cash flows using the indirect method for the year ended 31st of December 2011. So what you'll also notice is that in the Excel sheet, I have copied in all of the data from the balance sheets. Strictly speaking, you don't have to do that, but you might find that it's a slight advantage because it allows you to do some quick calculations of the changes between one year and the next, or said in another way, from the beginning to the ending balance. And that's exactly going to be our starting point. So I'm going to do a calculation of changes here that we're going to use when we uh, prepare the statement of cash flow. So the way to do this is that we want to look at the change from 2010 to 2011. Because remember what we talked about earlier, the end of 2010 is the same as the beginning of 2011. So it could also have stated beginning balance of 2011 here and ending balance of 2011 here. So that is essentially what we have. And this is just worth remembering and noting because you'll see that this is exactly how it works. So what we want to do is that we take the um, Calculation here in Excel, I would do it like uh, following, taking 2011 minus 2010 numbers, so that is for cash, 112,450 minus 87,000. And you see here, and this is a good sanity check, that it has increased by 25,450. And this looks roughly right when you look at the numbers. If you get a negative number here, then you will have noticed or you should notice at least that you have to do it the other way around so of course as you can see it increases by some amount and in this case by 25,450 so when you've done it in excel like this you can essentially repeat the calculation all the way down and i'm just going to mark this in yellow so that it's very clear to us and then we just need to make a few adjustments to this change calculation. And that is because when we're doing statement of cash flows, there are a few numbers that we don't need. First of all, we don't need the totals of the assets and liabilities. So the 62,000 here and the 62,500 here, I'm going to delete that. Also, given that we're looking at changes in cash flows, when we do the statement of cash flows, we're also not going to use this change in cash. So you can also delete that for now. Finally, you'll also notice that this accumulated depreci uh, depreciation, this change, you can leave that, but we also have that given in the income statement. So you can either keep it or leave it. That's up to you. Once you have something looking like this, we are ready to go. And if you have chosen to not copy in this data and simply do it one item at a time, that's perfectly fine as well. You will get to the same result at the end, but I find that it can be useful to set it up like this in Excel because it allows you to basically manage this change calculation with a bit more ease. So with that said, let's try to jump into doing the actual statement of cash flows. And when we do a statement, whether that's an income statement, a balance sheet, or a statement of retained earnings, we always want to start by just writing that this is what we're doing. So statement of cash flows for the period, yeah, let's just write 2011 for the year, for the period, that's up to you what you want to write, something like this. And I'll just want to make it look, if not exactly beautiful, then at least just somewhat manageable. And given that we're looking at a company that is operating and reporting its financials in British pounds, I'll just note here GBP for British pounds. So in this case, when we start the financial statement, if you recall from the first video, we always start by looking at operating activities. That is this part up here. So if we have a look here, we're going to write operating activities just to make it clear that this is what we're looking at. 
And recall from the introduction that what we use here is the net income and the current assets and current liabilities. So a very important thing to note here, and this is always a starting point when we do the statement of cash flows using the indirect method, is that we start by using the net income. So the first thing we do here is that we take net income and the amount will have to refer to the exercise text where you can see that the net income is 81,500. So that will be our starting point. And this, by the way, is always the case. We always start with the net income. So whenever you are asked to do a statement of cash flows, you always start with the net income, just like we did here. And then we'll proceed. I just want to make a thousand separator like this. And the next thing we always do is to consider if there's any depreciation, because if there is depreciation, then we want to add that back. And I'll explain why in a second, but for now, Let's just see here that there is depreciation expense of 10,500. So I'm going to add back 10,500 like this. Now, this is counterintuitive for most until they have a good explanation as to why we do this. Consider for a moment, what is depreciation? We have a separate exercise on depreciation where we go much further into the details of depreciation. But what you may recall and know is that depreciation is essentially the allocation of the cost of an asset over some period of time. Usually this time is the useful uh, time or life of the asset. But what this means in terms of cash flow, and this is really critical to understand, is that depreciation has no cash implication. There is no cash being spent, even though we have a depreciation expense. And this is because it's simply an accounting expense where we distribute the cost of an asset over a period of time. What this means is also that the cash movement happens when we buy the asset or sell the asset, but not in the period in between those two points where we depreciate. In between these two points, it's simply an accounting expense that we refer to as a non-cash expense. So I'll just make a note here. Note depreciation is added back to net income because it is a non-cash expense. So if we did not add it back here, we would have a situation where we had net income being basically too low because net income is correct or correctly stated to be 81,500. But in cash terms, we have actually also generated 10,500 more than the net income. And this would not be reflected if we don't add back depreciation like we do here. So this is a way to correct or adjust the fact that depreciation is a non-cash expense. So if you remember nothing else from this, it is always add back depreciation. But of course, understanding why we do this, basically that it's a non-cash expense, is a good idea. And it's nice to know why we actually do it. So having included now the net income, what we want to do next is that we want to look at the changes or movements in current assets and current liabilities. So we'll refer back to our balance sheets from before here and consider if there are any current assets. So let's just have a look. Remember that cash, of course, is a current asset. But given that we're doing a statement of cash flows, we'll eventually be seeing this change in cash later. So for now, we'll not include that here. However, there are a few of these assets that are current assets, right? Remember that current assets are defined by having a lifetime of less than one year or an expected lifetime of less than one year. And by definition, accounts receivable and inventory will be included here. So what we want to do is that we'll take them one by one. And in this case, accounts receivable, as you can see here, is decreasing from the beginning to ending balance by 7,700. Now, what does that mean in terms of cash? Let's have a look at the rules from before in case we've forgotten. If assets go down, this is what it says here, it means that cash goes up, right? And in this case, account receivable has decreased, it has gone down, and therefore the cash effect is positive. And the reason for this, just to explain that very briefly, is that we have managed to decrease our account receivable. That is, we have collected more payments from our customers, and therefore, of course, we've been paid in cash. So 
let's add this because it's a negative change in account receivable and a negative change in assets is always resulting in a positive cash effect. So in this case, we'll add accounts receivable. And it's really important here to use the interpretation rules from before these ones here. And I'll just copy them down so that we can refer to them at all times when we complete this exercise, that when assets go down, cash goes up. Always remember that and always remember these four rules here. So account receivable will be uh, having a positive cash effect of 7,700. So that is where we use this change number here, this change calculation that we have. The next thing we want to do is that we want to take inventory and have a look at what has happened to inventory. And what we can see is that inventory has increased from 18,000 to 23,000. Now, what does that mean in terms of cash? Well, let's refer to the rules. As you can see, when assets go up, it means that cash goes down. Essentially, we have tied more cash in the inventory and therefore it has a negative cash effect. Therefore, we are going to make an entry here of a minus inventory, where the amount is, of course, minus 5,000, like this. Property and equipment is an asset, but it's not a current asset. Rather, it's a non-current asset. So we'll be using it under investment activities. Let's consider if there are any current liabilities that we can include here. Remember, current liabilities are defined as having a maturity of less than a year. So in this case here, we can see that there are a few of these liabilities that qualify for this. Specifically, accounts payable and wages payable would be current liabilities. Note payable could be current, but given that it says long term here, it's fair to assume that it's a non-current liability. So accounts payable, let's just have a look at what happens here. You can see that it's decreasing from 39,900 to 8,000. This corresponds to, as we've calculated, a change of minus 31,900. Now, what does this mean in terms of cash? Let's have a look at the rules. When liabilities and equity go down, that is what happens here, the cash effect is that cash goes down or the cash effect is negative. So in this case, we'll want to include a minus here, accounts payable, and the amount, of course, which is minus 31,900, like this. Then we want to have a look at wages payable, which you can see goes down from 3,300 to zero, corresponding, of course, to a change of minus 3,300. So the cash effect is, again, negative because the liability goes down and therefore will include a negative wages payable here and the amount of minus 3,300, like so. Once you are certain that you have included all current assets and current liabilities, you can sum up these cash movements that you have made for the operating activities. Usually, it's nice to write something like cash flows from operating activities or operations, uh, operating activities. I'll just write it up like this and leave a bit more space. And what we do then is that we add up all of these cash movements that we have identified. That means we get a total cash flow or cash flows from operating activities corresponding to 59,500. So we're not quite done yet, right? Because this was just one of the three sections. Remember, there is also an investment section and an financing uh, section. So we want to include these and we'll take them one by one. So investment activities is next. What you may recall from the brief theory introduction is that we include long-term or non-current assets under investment activities. So let's just have a look at what kind of non-current assets we have under investment, oh, sorry, under um, our balance sheet here. And in this case, we can see that property and equipment is a non-current asset, meaning that it has an expected lifetime of more than a year. That's generally the case for property and equipment. And you'll notice that it has gone up from 155,000 to 205, uh, 1,250. As per our calculation, this corresponds to an increase of 50,250, which means that if we interpret it with the cash lens here, we have that assets have gone up 
and the result in terms of cash is that cash has gone down. So I'll want to notice here or note that we have a negative property and equipment. That is what is the cash effect. That's why I write it as a minus, of course. And that is minus 50,250, like so. Let's just make sure that we are certain that there are no more non-current assets. We'll have a look and we'll see that that is not the case. Remember that the accumulated depreciation here, that is a result of the depreciation that we have here. And therefore, we've already used that in the previous section. So with that, we can actually conclude our investment activities. I'll just borrow this section here from the operating activities and change it to be investment activities. So it looks like this. And of course, I want to make sure that we're just adding up the one number here. So, so far, so good. Your statement of cash flows should look like this at this point. And let's move on to the final uh, section, which is financing activities. Like so. And remember from our brief theory introduction that financing activities include two things, namely non-current liabilities and equity. So let's take them one by one. The first thing we want to look at is the note payable here, right? Because that is, of course, a non-current liability, and therefore we want to include that. You'll see that it is decreased by 28500 and that corresponds to a negative cash effect of the same amount. So that will be the first part that I include here, namely that we have uh, the note payable and the amount, of course, minus 28,500. Now, I'm just writing the category or the name of the asset or liability. If you like, you could write something more elaborate, but it's not necessary. So an example of something more elaborate would be, for instance, repayment of loan on the note payable, that would be just a way to explain what is going on. But it's not really necessary as long as it's clear what is the asset or liability that you're using and what is the cash effect as we're showing here. So that was the non-current liability. Then we have contributed capital. And what you notice is that there is a clear change in that as well. More specifically, it has gone up from 66,000 to 160,000. That corresponds to an increase of 94,000, which we should, of course, include. And if you recall from our rules here, the way to interpret this is that if equity goes up, it means that cash goes up. And this makes sense, right? Because if contributed capital has gone up, it must be because the investors have paid in additional capital. So that is what has happened here. So we'll just write that here, contributed capital, and the amount, of course, 94,000. Finally, what you have to do as a slightly more perhaps confusing thing or tricky thing, if you like, is that you want to look at retained earnings. and if retained earnings, the change of retained earnings more specifically, corresponds to the net income, then you know that no dividends have been paid out. But if the retained earnings, the change in the retained earnings is lower than the net income, then you will know that something has happened in terms of a dividend payment. Because recall that retained earnings is simply the addition or summation of the net incomes. So if no dividends have been paid out, then we would simply add 81,500 to the existing 62,800, and then we would get to some new balance here. Now, this is not the case here, right? Because what we see is that the change in retained earnings is only 32,200, while the net income is 81,500. And it's not stated anywhere in the text that there has been a dividend payment, but we can deduce that based on these numbers. We know that the only way to change the retained earnings is either by increasing it with net income or decreasing it with dividend payments. And this is a really important thing to be aware of because, as I mentioned, it's slightly trickier than the others, probably you'll find as well. And therefore, just being very aware of this is very useful. So let's figure out how much has been paid out in dividends because the pure net income effect has been accounted for here. 
But what has happened is that there has been some kind of movement that is different from the net income, and this is what would be our um, dividend payment. Now, the way to calculate it is verify. I'll just write it out here, uh, maybe a bit further down, so that it's verify if dividends have been paid by adding net income to retained earnings beginning balance. If the balance is different from the, oh sorry, if the change is different from net income, you know that dividends have been paid. So let's just do that first. And this is just to say the same thing that we talked about earlier. But in this case, we would have that the beginning balance was 62,800 plus 81,500. That was net income. And let's just do a brief calculation of that to see what this gives us. That is 144,000. So this is what it should have been. And I'll just update that with the bracket here so it looks a bit better. Now, if there had been no dividend payment, then we would have that this balance here at the end should have been essentially 144,300. Now, that's clearly not the case. So the way to determine the dividends, to determine the dividends, we can subtract the ending balance stated in the balance sheet from the amount found above. So what we'll do is that we'll take the 144,300 minus 95,000, and that will give us a dividend payment, which in this case you can see is 49,300. And of course, as always, I'll just show you the calculation. And this is a slight extra thing that you have to be aware of always when you do a statement of cash flows is to verify if there are any, so to speak, hidden dividends, hidden in the sense that they're not stated in the exercise, but of course they're apparent from the numbers here. So in this case, we'll want to subtract that because of course dividends is something that has a negative cash effect and the amount is 49,300. So having then used all of the assets and liabilities, we can add up these cash flows to be the cash flows from financing activities. And the amount will be, if we just add these up, is as always just the sum of the cash movements. In this case, these movements here, where what we have is 16,200. So we are almost getting there. The only thing we wanna do now as a final thing is to calculate the total cash flows which we find, and this is important, as the sum of the cash flows from operating activities plus the sum of the cash flows from investment activities plus the cash flows from financing activities. So in other words, we add up these sums here, like I'm doing here, and you should get a total cash flows that is 25,450. Now, this also corresponds, as we'll see in a moment, to what we can see in the balance sheet. But what you want to do if you want to make this perfect and complete is that you add the beginning balance. So maybe just beginning cash balance like this, which we can find by looking in the balance sheet here, 87,000. That is also what is stated in the text here. So we add 87,000 and then we have the ending balance, ending cash balance to be more specific which is these two added together. Now, if we have done this correctly, you'll want to notice that this ending cash balance should be equal to the ending balance stated in the balance sheet. So you can always verify if you've done the statement of cash flows correctly by looking at the balance sheet and verifying, and in this case, we can fortunately verify that it is correct, that this amount here, 112,400, uh, uh, 450, sorry, corresponds to what we have found as the ending cash balance here. In other words, also 112,450. 
And this is, of course, important because it means that we've actually done the statement of cash flows correctly. This was question one, showing how to do a statement of cash flows. As always, with this, you have the tools necessary to do any kind of statement of cash flows. The rest is a matter of practice. So I really suggest that you try to do some different exercises of statement of cash flows. Also, you can repeat this exercise in a few days or just before the exam, just to verify that you can get this without watching the videos. And then you can watch the video to verify if you have the right answer. It's important for me to stress that this is a full statement of cash flows, but you could also get an exam exercise where you're only asked to do a section of it. So for instance, doing only the operating activities or only the financing activities, but it doesn't change the procedure and the approach. So knowing how to do a full statement of cash flows will allow you to do any kind of exercise within this. In the next question, we'll talk a bit about the implications of what we found here by commenting a bit on the results. Mm -hmm.